From 1923 to 1929, Stanley Bruce was the Prime Minister of Australia. Bro, you can't just do that. Do I actually have to do half an episode on Stanley Bruce? I just want to get straight to the Great Depression. Dude, he was Prime Minister for seven years. Imagine if his family was like watching this and you just say, hey, your grandfather gets less airtime than that pod racing level in Lego Star Wars. I mean, there is no shame in that, but fine. I'm going to have to go hard with the references here and no one is going to blame you for clicking off right now. Nah, the Stanley Bruce years aren't that bad. Do you remember Barclay McGain from that Young Liberals on Schoolies video? It's basically him being Prime Minister for seven years. But the reason I actually want to skip over him is because the end of this video is going to get so crazy and I really promise that this isn't clickbait. Also, well done to Jordan Coates for correctly guessing my preferred word art font. My subscriber question today is this. At the end of the video, you'll see a huge divide within the Labour Party. And so I want to ask you, whose side would you have taken during the last Labour divide? Kevin Rudd or Julia Gillard's? So later on in the 1980s, Stanley Bruce repeatedly claimed that his government was led not by ideological motives, but by strict business principles. And you'll see what he meant by this. But before I rip into him, I want to praise him for two reasons. Number one, he oversaw the transfer of federal parliament to Canberra, a huge moment in the development of the nation. And number two, he was completely inaccessible to lobbyists, although this wasn't really for noble reasons. As Bruce himself said, a dictator that can be sacked at the next election is incomparably the best form of government. And so he sought to repeatedly bypass parliament and get stuff done through his cabinet. As far as Bruce was concerned, he wanted less people interfering with him governing the country. And I called him a young liberal before, Essentially, he had the view that everyone's economic outcomes were a reflection of their work ethic, and so he therefore had utter disdain for both unions and social service programs. Yep, yep. we as Aussies absolutely toil, we deserve everything we get, and if you leave yourself down there, we're not going to pull you up. No way. Well, it's all about a hand up, not a hand out, isn't it? Too right. And so essentially, Bruce's solution to move the country forward was what he called the three M's. Men, money, and markets. And he looked to Britain to provide for all three of these. British migrants were to give Australia a more abundant population, the Bank of England was to give capital to Aussie businesses, and the British public was to buy Australian exports. This was particularly interesting because at the 1923 and 1926 Imperial Conferences, Canada and South Africa were trying to renegotiate their Dominion status to gain greater independence, but Bruce concerned himself entirely with his three M's. However, Bruce quickly ran into some big issues. The assisted migration schemes were extremely costly, and then with America going through the Roaring Twenties and having telephones, cars and proper roads, the Australian public was demanding the same thing. But in order to do this, Bruce needed money, and to get money, he had to take huge loans. It actually reached a point where 70% of all capital inflows came through loans rather than exports. All this inflation wasn't good for the Australian economy, and rather than blame the loans, Bruce blamed everything on people having too high wages. Then, to make things worse, the Bruce government adjusted the 1926 Crimes Act to make striking illegal and criticised pensions and social welfare. While all this was happening, Bruce was always off playing golf and riding horses, and he built himself a 16-room mansion in Frankston, Melbourne. Now, Bruce won the 1925 election pretty easily. This was the first election with compulsory voting, and tapping into the 40% of Australians who didn't vote in 1922, Bruce used classic Red Scare tactics and campaigned on sanity, safety and stability. However, 1928 was a little more difficult. Unemployment had risen to 11% and he really put the working classes offside. The feds had earlier charged coal mine owner John Brown for illegally locking out his workers. However, Bruce dropped those charges which really showed his hand in that he was pushing an anti-union agenda and also at the same time dropping charges against a tycoon acting illegally. That being said, Bruce won the 1928 election, but only by a slim majority. And in 1929, he really shot himself in the foot. He proposed that the states instead of the feds deal with industrial matters. However, nowhere in his election campaign did he actually mention this. As a result, his own party blocked this proposal from going through parliament, and this was spearheaded by one salty guy, Billy Hughes. You see, he was still filthy that Earl Page made him step down for Bruce, and he was ruthless in enacting revenge. With Bruce unable to control his party, another election was called in 1929, and this time, Bruce lost both Parliament and his seat in Flinders. After 13 years in the wilderness, Labour were finally back. But just two days after James Scullin took office as Prime Minister, America's Roaring Twenties came crashing down with the Black Thursday stock market crash. 
Honestly, this just has to be the worst possible timing for James Scullin. So if you don't know much about the depression, essentially during the 20s, heaps of Americans took loans from the bank to try and get in on the rising stock market. Think of it the same way that heaps of Australians have taken huge mortgages from the bank to try and get into the property market while it's still going up. Like with any bubble though, the value wasn't in the American companies themselves, but by people seeing a line that's going like this, which makes people buy in and keep the line going like this. But eventually, when that confidence is shaken, everything comes unraveling really quickly. In Australia, we're seeing this right now as the recent rise in interest rates are encouraging people to sell rather than pay off a mortgage. With lots of people wanting to sell, the prices of houses are dropping, and dropping fast. In the same way, on Black Thursday, again two days after Scullin's election, people started to sell their shares which made shareholders panic sell their shares before the value dropped any further, which then caused the value to drop much further. So only 4 million out of 120 million Americans had shares, right? So no real dramas. Well, not at all. Remember, those Americans took loans from the bank to pay for these shares, and they couldn't repay those banks which meant banks started to close. There was no banking insurance back then, so if the bank closed, you lost your savings. And so in a panic, many Americans withdrew their money which then forced the banks to close really quickly. So the net result was lost savings and no ability to get credit. Not ideal conditions for companies and so they started laying off workers. So much so that 25% of Americans were unemployed. So how did this affect Australia? Well, remember, we were an export economy who relied on global customers. Europe was dependent upon America for a post-World War I rebuild, and Japan's economy was in the tank because it couldn't export its silk. Stanley Bruce had moved Australia back in the direction of British economic dependence, so it's fair to say, we were stuffed. Now, Scullin was considered a safe pair of hands, but far from a crisis manager. Funnily enough, he'd earlier criticised Bruce for privatising the Commonwealth woollen mills, likening him to Mussolini. And Bruce's parting advice to Scullin was that as Prime Minister, he should play golf to keep himself strong. In fact, Scullin opted for the complete opposite route and declined to stay in the Canberra Lodge and instead lived in a modest hotel. So Labor were going into the depression without holding treasury in 13 years. Just for context, 13 years ago I was smashing a pack of jumpies a day and watching Corey in the house. Just as a quick side note, some of you guys think I'm like 50. I referenced Lego Star Wars nearly every episode. Anyway. Not only had it been forever since Labor managed the economy, but because there was no Senate election in 1929, they were outnumbered 28 to 8 in the upper house. To make matters worse, the Bruce government had left them with no money and an 11% unemployment rate to combat the depression. So what did James Scullin do? To be honest, not that much. To increase cash flow, he increased social service payments and at the same time cut back Bruce's assisted immigration program to save costs, but not long afterwards he was off to London for the Imperial Conference. Essentially, at this conference, Scullin demanded that for the first time an Aussie by the glorious name of Isaac Isaacs be our Governor General. King George V was furious at this, but ultimately assented to Scullin's demand. Now Scullin's treasurer was a guy called Ted Theodore, and Theodore actually resigned amid accusations of corruption. But when Scullin returned from the UK, he reappointed Theodore which incensed one of his cabinet members, who will be very important in this series, Joseph Lyons. Lyons defected from Labor to form the UAP, not Clive Palmer's UAP, and to be honest, there's so much that's about to go down that we'll get into this later. It's huge, but not even the biggest part of the Depression story. Scullin made another controversial appointment by making Robert Gibson head of the Commonwealth Bank, which back then was government controlled rather than privately controlled. However, Gibson refused to expand the bank's credit line to stimulate the economy unless Scullin reduced the Australian pension. Scullin refused, and this meant that he couldn't actually enact the fiscal policy that he was after. Australia's unemployment rate was moving towards the 30s, and so Scullin's party enemies started to make moves against him. Five of his Labor members defected and supported the UAP in calling a vote of no confidence in the Scullin government. Now, there was one guy who wasn't even in Parliament who was spearheading this movement and was determined to trigger an election in 1931 to take down Scullin. His name was Jack Lang, Premier of New South Wales. Thanks for watching, you really don't want to miss next week as we put the feds on hold to take our first visit into state politics. It's a Jack Lang episode. And again, I promise this is not clickbait, things get even more intense than this week. We're talking about Lang making a legal case that the federal government were making New South Wales its slaves under the Anti-Slavery Act, and threatening to arrest the New South Wales governor so that he wouldn't be dismissed. Only just based on that one fact we should be learning something about him in our education system, they don't want you to know about his existence. Turn on notifications so you don't miss it.